My name is Pan Davis, Marist College, Poughkeepsie, New York. The title of this presentation is Financing the Commodity Frontier, the Creation of New Financial Institutions. So there is in the literature a discussion of the financial revolution of 1720. Finance, as we know, is very creative, but often mysterious, especially concepts like public debt and public credit. Finance scholars celebrate the voluntary nature of financial markets in which people trade financial assets like treasury bonds. For example, credit is voluntary, unlike taxes. Investors choose to buy government bonds because they are safe assets and very liquid with a reasonable rate of return. But I would like to ask the question, is credit really voluntary or is it coerced? It may be voluntary for the rich based on confidence in the debtor's ability to repay, or based on expected returns compared with the risks. Or we have today too big to fail financial institutions, which may get bailed out by the government and experience very little risk. On the other hand, credit may be coercive for the poor. Borrowing may be necessary for subsistence provision or for access to shelter. It is punishable by courts if not repaid, such as debtor's prison, bankruptcy, crime of counterfeit. And governments, poor governments especially, may need to borrow to meet tax shortfall. So I want to bring this together with the idea of the commodity frontier that Jason Moore and others have written about. How was the commodity frontier financed? So it turns out that state and military capacity to explore and conquer colonies was funded by public debt. This public debt was backed by the profits from the slave trade. And then the slave trade enabled further extension of the commodity frontier, which then required extension of the financing. This is in a way a self-reinforcing process based on the exponential growth of finance and debt, according to David Harvey, and the competition for capital among European countries, according to John Shavlin. So let's look at some of this history for a few minutes. Before the Bank of England, money was gold coin, but very few people had gold coin. You could obtain it by foreign trade. If you got bullion, you could take it to the mint and get coin for a fee. But most people didn't have coin or bullion. And the collections for taxes were made via tallies, notches on a stick. But then in the early 1600s, there was developed merchant monopoly corporations like the Dutch VOC and the English EOC. And these corporations had a combination of coercion and voluntary. So their stocks were available on newly developing financial markets that was voluntary, but they were trading in slaves, which was coercion, and they were both allowed to use force in order to explore and develop and conquer colonies. So on the one hand, the stock market was voluntary where the stock of these corporations was traded, but the trade in slaves and the exploitation of colonies was coercive. These corporations, as it turned out, were part of what we are going to call the financial revolution. So after the glorious revolution of 1688 in England, there was more interest in learning about finance from the lessons of the Dutch Republic. So the Bank of England was formed in 1694 
as a new corporation with a monopoly charter by the king. And the bank was given the gold supply of the country along with bonds, which enabled it to collect interest. But in return for the charter, the Bank of England gave loans to the government. And then on the other hand, it was able to issue banknotes, which circulated as money to the public. And then the public was able to pay taxes with those banknotes. And so this enabled the expansion of the money supply and also created a new monopoly corporation called the Bank of England. So like other merchants and corporations of the time, the Bank of England had a T account where it had to account for assets and liabilities. So its assets were government bonds, gold reserves, and stock that subscribers were able to buy and its liabilities were the notes. So the Bank of England held government debt as an asset collecting interest. It also held the gold supply of the government and depositors. In return, it was able to issue stock to the public and notes which circulated as currency. It acquired monopoly status and note issue in 1708 and the quantity of note issue was finally stipulated by the Bank Act of 1844 based on its gold reserve, after which it more or less operated like a central bank. And here is an example of the political satire. Not everyone liked paper money or thought it was the best way to run the country. So this is a cartoon by James Gilray about Prime Minister William Pitt picking the pockets of the Bank of England, here imagined as an old lady who could be ravished by the government. And as always, the fear was too much paper money would be circulated and give the government too much power. But these state chartered business corporations in England and the Dutch Republic began what we now call financial markets. On the one hand, there's the state issuing public debt. And on the other hand, there are the business corporations issuing stocks and bonds. And the routine trading of these financial assets began in commercial centers like London and Amsterdam. But of course, this wasn't enough. So there were further innovations in 1711, a new monopoly corporation was founded called the South Sea Company. This corporation was designed to help finance the government's debt. So they arranged what's now called a debt equity swap, where people who were holding government debt could exchange it with the South Sea Company in return for stocks of the South Sea Company. That accomplished the reduction of outstanding government debt, which the government liked, and it was now held by the South Sea Company. And the South Sea Company was given a monopoly on the slave trade, the Asiento contract, which made the stock of the South Sea Company more attractive. And so what we have is a new corporation with a monopoly on the slave trade with Spain and a new corporation that could help the government finance its debt. As it turned out, there was a bubble in South Sea stock. People found this corporation so attractive and the idea of the slave trade that there was a a bubble in the stock, which ultimately collapsed. But in fact, the bubble was supported by government propagandists who wanted the South Sea corporate stock to be popular. And this in fact was what is called the revolution of 1720s. So now you have the public issuing public debt and currency by means of the Bank of England 
you know, the private corporations issuing stocks and bonds in so-called public sphere of investors and informed citizens who could look at government bonds and corporate stock and make their decisions, but also to ask questions about the management of the government and these corporations. And this is ultimately what Jürgen Habermas has called the public sphere, where the critical free press was first the free press circulating information about financial assets and prices. And ultimately, after the South Sea bubble, the government established more regulation over the financial markets. And today we see a very similar structure of the US Federal Reserve, which was founded much later in 1913. Well, as an aside, we have to realize that Alexander Hamilton tried much earlier to have a Bank of the United States, but it was hated because it was, well, a corporation. And Jefferson and Hamilton had a partisan split on this basis. And later, Andrew Jackson refused to renew the charter. So we had essentially no central bank until 1913, but the structure is much the same. The assets are our own debt, US Treasury bonds, no longer so much gold reserves, but hard currency reserves from other countries. And its liabilities are the commercial bank reserves and US dollars. So we have very much like a circular flow of currency, which is issued based on government debt, which is then realized by economic activity and tax payments, which then pay off that debt. And oddly, there's a hierarchy of money. The safest assets are considered state assets. And globally, there is also a ranking. The global currencies, which are the strongest, are the wealthiest countries with the strongest military. And this hierarchy remains for, for centuries now, but is not explained in mainstream finance. And today we have third world debt where the same logic of assets and liabilities drives public and private finance. In sovereignty, you might argue, is conditioned by global capital markets. Not all countries can issue debt in their own currency. And when they do issue debt, they have to issue it in the hard currency countries, which means they have to export to get that hard currency, which is another form of coercion. So today we don't have slavery in colonies, but we do have third world countries, which are subject to what Eichen Green called original sin. They can't issue debt in their own currency. They need to acquire hard currency currency, which means they have to export, which means they have to sometimes have cash crops, which can destroy their ecology. And even today, there's still a global competition for credit and financial markets, which tends to advantage the advanced industrial countries. So this structure of finance that was formed in the 17th and 18th century is essentially still with us today. I would argue the coercive features would remain unless we have global standards in labor, environment, and taxes. Without those standards, markets can be coercive, driving the behavior of the world's most intelligent species and the dynamics of the global biogeochemical cycles. So in the Anthropocene, can we come up with a new form of finance? I would argue, yes, we could easily issue credits based on the IMF and special drawing rights with ecological indicators. So that's feasible, but it's not clear that politically, the awareness of the world's countries of the world's leading capitalist countries are ready to address the Anthropocene in a comprehensive way like that. Thank you very much.